How do you go from being one of the most promising NBA players alongside Kobe Bryant and Gilbert Arenas, making over $5 million in basketball money, to a convicted felon behind bars? Let's find out. In high school, the player who would go on to become a murderer was described as intelligent, thoughtful, generous, and well-mannered. And his name was Javaris Crittenden. Javaris loved science projects, and his high school principal remembers him as a bright student with a 3.5 GPA. He was a part of the future business leaders of America Club, ready to take the world by storm. Not only was he successful in school, he also was a monster on the court. And when the press started knocking because they saw a future in him, Javaris was polite and answered them with a yes sir or a no sir. He made sure to show up to interviews in a suit. Crittenden grew up in one of the most ghetto parts of Georgia in southwest Atlanta. Javaris's mother was very aware of this fact, and she wanted to make sure that her son stayed out of gang activity. So, she sent him to Southwest Atlanta Christian Academy, a Bible school with a strict dress code and disciplinary rules. At home, Javaris had no male role model, as he was raised by his mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, and an aunt, and his guardians raised him to the best of their ability and kept him in the right circles. He didn't get into any trouble in high school or college until he reached the NBA. As a high school basketball player, he played alongside a future Hall of Famer in Dwight Howard, and the duo led Southwest Atlanta to a state championship, putting both of the young players on the map. Javaris was considered the top point guard prospect in the country at that time, but in high school, he was always overshadowed by the better prospect Dwight Howard, and that gave him a chip on his shoulder. When Dwight became the number one pick in the draft, Javaris had to prove himself just as skilled as his former teammate. He averaged 28.4 points a game the year that Dwight left, and showed the world that he wasn't just a shadow of Howard. He garnered the attention of his favorite local college, Georgia Tech, and when Paul Hewitt came knocking, Javaris accepted a scholarship with enthusiasm. Crittenden had a great rookie season where he showed rare leadership traits, which was uncommon for a player who had only played for one year. He averaged 14.4 points, and was looking pretty promising. Hewitt wanted Javaris to step into a bigger leadership position in his sophomore year, but Javaris refused, and this may have been one of the biggest mistakes of his life. While Crittenden was a good enough player to go to the pros, his coaches and players felt that he needed a bit more poise and maturity that a second year in college would provide. His rash decision to deny them and go to the NBA quickly may have been the wrong decision. His lack of maturity would contribute to him later committing the first of two crimes that would start his criminal track record. In a draft class headed by heavyweights such as Kevin Durant, Greg Oden, and Al Horford, Javaris Crittenden was taken 19th overall by the Los Angeles Lakers. It is an accomplishment in itself to be drafted in the first round in such a stacked draft class, and he was thrilled to be playing alongside superstar Kobe Bryant. Javaris was excited to get started and show the world what he was worth. The chip on his shoulder that he had developed in high school was still there. He thought he should have been drafted first overall, not 19th. Despite his high expectations for himself, he flopped as a prospect for the Lakers. He didn't show what he was made of in practice, along with the coach Phil Jackson being someone who hardly ever gave rookies opportunities. He only averaged seven minutes a game, and a bit under four points a game. Javaris was disappointed. He felt that he would do better given an opportunity, but there was no opportunity. His team's disbelief in him had worn down his psyche, and he was drawn towards off-the-court appreciation to feel fulfilled. Crittenden met a prominent gang member by the name of Asfa Bebe at a nightclub one night in 2007, and that began a close relationship. A Bebe appreciated Javaris as a human and took him out to see the hottest girls and drink the best alcohol. He knew that Javaris was feeling down about his lack of playing time. They started hanging out daily, and Abebe introduced him to the rest of the gang. He was a member of the Crips, and was later arrested for murder in 2010. Even while he was in jail, he and Javaris continued to be friends, and Abebe showed him how to protect himself. After some time spent together, Abebe recruited Javaris into the Crips. Police informants say that Javaris was walked into the gang due to his celebrity status instead of being jumped in, which means that he didn't have to fight to get into the gang like typical gang inductees. Abebe and all other associated parties deny that Crittenden was associated with the Crips, but Javaris has a crypt hand sign holding a bandana tattooed on his midsection. I mean, if that's not evidence, I don't know what is. The gang is based out of LA, so when Javaris was traded only eight months after being drafted, people had hopes for his future with the Memphis Grizzlies. And it surprisingly worked out for him. He grinded day after day, and eventually, Javaris got over 16 minutes a game and was averaging over seven points a game. He even posted a career high with 22 points, and he made a huge impact on the defensive end 
as well. But he would receive more disheartening news after another year with the Grizzlies. Javaris received a call that he was to be traded to the Wizards right when he was getting his footing. He had stayed out of trouble and hadn't been seen engaging with the Crips, but the trade again brought up his feelings of self-doubt. Was he destined to be an NBA star? Or was he always going to live in the shadow of his teammates? Turns out, the Wizards already had their guy, and Javaris was just there to compliment him and to hopefully grow as a young athletic prospect. Gilbert Arenas had just been signed to a $111 million dollar contract but had a devastating injury shortly after. So, Javaris was a way that the Wizards sought to pick up the pieces. Crittenden housed those feelings of second best, and this time, he may have been even less so. He felt like an outsider at the Wizards. They had their own little inside jokes, and he didn't know how to make his way in. A journalist said that Crittenden was just waiting for his chance to play, but he had rare opportunities to do so. And when he did, he blew it. He couldn't lead the team like he did in college. His teammates' jokes started getting to him, and he no! lashed out, insulting their families and girlfriends. And he became further isolated. Javaris started sitting on the other side of the plane on the way to the games. His feelings caused his worst NBA incident. All of his self-doubt boiled over into a dumb decision. One day, Gilbert and the other Joker teammates invited Javaris to play a game of cards with them and gamble. It was tradition for the team to play on the way to the games, and they bet ludicrous amounts of money. Javaris didn't really have much money to play with. He had significantly smaller contracts than the others, and Gilbert had his over $100 million contract, so he threw money around, and he won quite a lot. He asked for his money from Gilbert, and he refused. It was apparently a rule that they wouldn't pay out until the next flight. Crittenden hadn't heard about this so-called rule, so they got into a fight. They got into each other's faces, and Gilbert told them that he was nothing compared to him. So, one of them told the other to settle this in the locker room the next day before practice. Javaris stepped into the locker room to see a table in front of his locker, with four guns laid out. A sticky note was placed above his locker that said, pick one. It was a threat. And who else could it be from but Gilbert Arenas, the alpha of the team, the guy that Crittenden always wanted to be. But Javaris came prepared. He didn't need Gilbert's handouts. Arenas walked into the locker room and yelled at him. He said that if he thought he was so tough, then he would take one and fight. But Javaris already had his own. He took out his piece and aimed it at Gilbert. Unlike Gilbert's, his was loaded. Neither ended up shooting, but this went on to ruin the careers of both players. They were both suspended, and Javaris was out of the league that year. Gilbert hardly hung on for three more years. His play declined as well as his reputation. Javaris clawed his way into a contract with a Chinese basketball team, and he succeeded there despite the incident. He averaged over 25 points a game there, and he got the attention of the NBA again. He was invited to play for an NBA G League team, and he did pretty well there, but not good enough to make it back. So so, Javaris coped in the same way he had before. He went back to his crip roots, he hung out with his gang, went to nightclubs, and helped the gang round up money. While he was out, a blood came by his house and stole his expensive jewelry. Javaris was livid. Nothing in his life had gone how he wanted it to. He wanted to become a star NBA player and the main guy, and it had never happened. He grinded and grinded and worked, and it never paid off. So. After all of his failure, it was time he did something right. Crittenden and his cousin decided to make a life-altering decision. They were going to get their revenge. What? Javaris drove his Chevy Tahoe up the street to Macon Drive in broad daylight. They spotted the blood they were looking for walking on the sidewalk, and Javaris opened fire. But the blood wasn't alone. There were bystanders on the sidewalk as well, and they missed the blood completely. Instead, Javaris had shot the leg of a mother named Julianne Jones. And, even more, his target was completely unscathed. Crittenden was devastated. What had he done? He needed to get out. He booked a flight back to his hometown in Atlanta. He needed to be home with his family, but the police found him and detained him. His failed escape made him look even more guilty. Javaris went in front of the court and pled guilty to voluntary manslaughter and was sentenced to 23 years in prison. But that's not where this story ends. Crittenden was released from jail 13 years early. He had to serve for only 8 years. Apparently, he cut a deal, and the court felt he was in a unique position to influence the youth to not go down a path like his. This year in April, he was released. He already went on Gilbert Arenas' podcast and talked about all the history they've had together, and Javaris even dissuaded John Morant from continuing his illegal antics. The antics that I'm sure you didn't know about were Victor Wembanyama's, like when he said he didn't look up to any NBA players. Click here if you want to hear more things you didn't know about him.